Hello everyone, this is Doug, and in this part, we are gonna finally talk about acetals, right? So we already covered hydrates and hemiacetals, and then we talk about the acetals, the full acetals. Well, how are they different? Why are they more stable? What do we use them for? So again, right, we're looking at acetals here. So this group, we've already talked about hydrates, we've already talked about hemiacetals, and then the next two videos, we'll talk about imines and enamines, and just like how we make them, you know, what the reagents look like. So acetals, finally, we've gotten to something that actually is stable, right? Remember that uh, hydrates were not stable. They were in equilibrium. They just, they form, they unform, they form, they unform. Same thing with hemiacetals. Um, they're not very stable. Typically, there's an equilibrium between the parent carbonyl and the acetal. And we said that cyclic hemiacetals, excuse me, cyclic hemiacetals are relatively more stable for um, entropic reasons. Acetals are stable. Once you make them, they're good. You can bottle them up. You can get like, you can isolate them. You can run them through a column if you make sure it's not too acidic. Um, but you can actually go and like buy an acetal and you can do stuff to acetals. They're, they're much, much more stable, right? And recall that the only real difference here is that with um, acetals, you just need two equivalents of that alcohol, whatever that generic alcohol is. So um, again, in this case, I'll just use methanol to kind of highlight this. So methanol. Um, I'll say excess in this case, but you just need at least two equivalents in theory. Normally we do these reactions in the alcohol that we want to use. So there's a huge amount, a huge excess, but you just, the idea is that you need at least two equivalents. <clears throat> and when you make these, and also notice I used a one-way arrow here. When you make these, the idea is that you just replace that carbonyl, right? That carbonyl carbon now is going to have two of the OR groups on it. So for me, my R was a methyl. It doesn't have to be a methyl, it can be an ethyl, an isopropyl, or whatever. Um, but you replace the, whatever was at the carbonyl carbon here, right? So whatever was here, that is now replaced with two ethers. And right, recall that ethers are very, very stable to everything except acid. So um, let me erase that. Let me just make a note here, right? Acetals <clears throat> are very stable. Acetals are stable and unreactive to everything but acids. Right, so they're, they are not susceptible to oxidations or reductions or bases, um, they just stay put. It's only the acids that make them unravel. <clears throat> and we'll talk about unraveling them later. Um, and I think I mentioned in the overview, right? You unravel them just by adding acid and water. So let's do a, a second example here. Um, let's do, well, let me do, yeah, let me do an example like, like this here. So let's say hypothetically, right, we said that, oh, well, if I have, I need two equivalents of OH, right? So CH2, um, and I need another equivalent of an alcohol, right? So here we have two equivalents of an alcohol, and I get it, I need a, an H plus as a catalyst, right? H plus catalyst, and I'll write cat. <clears throat> now you might be thinking that you've caught another one of my mistakes, but what I want to make here is, well, the point I want to make is that it looks like there's two equivalents of alcohol because I've written two things, but let's say hypothetically they were connected, right? So it's one molecule, but has two OHs on it. The idea is that it functions the same here, right? So I have, let's see how many carbons I have. One, two, three carbons. This is going to make the same sort of acetal, same mechanism, same everything. The only difference here is that instead of having two groups at this carbon where I have an O CH2 and an O CH2 that were separate, the idea is that now they are attached. So what you end up making are these sort of cyclic acetals. So this is the same thing as saying O O and that they're bridge. Oops, sorry. Uh, one, two, three carbons. I drew two carbons. <clears throat> Let me fix that. So three carbons, right? So that this would be my carbon one, two, and three. And this spot right here, this uh, aldehyde carbon, that's this one, that's this one. So you can also see cyclic acetals, which are used a lot and are even more stable, again, for those entropic reasons that we we're talking about before. So you can see acetals that are two individual alcohols, but oftentimes you can see them when they're just some diol. So like in this case, I have a propane diol thing. Um, 
Where do you see these? You do actually see acetals in natural products. They're not super duper common, but they are around. So here's two examples here, right? Where we've got an acetal here, right? That's the carbon that has an OR group on it and another OR group on it. So this is the acetal carbon, right? OR, so OR, OR. Same thing for this molecule, right? Here's the acetal carbon. You have an OR and an OR on that one. So sometimes you do see them show up in natural products, so it's worthwhile knowing how to make them. Their real use to a synthetic chemist, at least, is that they're great protecting groups. And I'm not going to show you this in this video, I'll do a separate video, but they are make great protecting groups for hiding a ketone or aldehyde that you don't want to react. And then you can bring it back later by just adding acid and water. So I'll talk more about that later. So how do these form, right? So here's, here's an example from the front, right, with the methanol. And I gave a specific acid, and I have this 2-propanone, or 2-pentanone. And if I take a look at this, I'll go ahead and I'll add my lone pairs, and I'll draw some stuff out. <clears throat> so I've got H+, plus, HSO4-, minus, and I've got two equivalents of methanol. Right now I've got my partial charges, so I'll just go ahead and label those so that I can see all of my nucleophiles and electrophiles. And again, since I'm in acidic conditions, I definitely want to imagine here that, um, well, I mean, since I, since I am in acidic conditions, I've got that H+. Plus. That's the thing with the largest charge on it, so that's what's going to react first. Yes, it can add to the methanols, but it's not really going to go anywhere. It's just going to protonate, deprotonate. But if it goes under the carbonyl, like we saw in the hemiacetal um, uh, video, you actually make your carbonyl more nucleophilic. Or, sorry, more electrophilic. And now it can be attacked by these poor nucleophiles, this methanol. Right, and again, we have a resonance structure. Right, where I can have these electrons move up. And then I get these resonance structures. <clears throat> Again, just like before, it doesn't matter which one of these contributors you draw electrons to. The top one is nice because it's got full octets. The bottom one's nice because the charge is more stable. Whichever one you want to do is totally fine. I'm going to do the top one. So I have these electrons kick or attack the carbonyl. Those electrons kick up. And then we've got an OH, I've got the O-methyl, and it's just like with the hemiacetal um, video with the mechanism, right? So far there's no difference in these mechanisms. I've got a oxygen with a positive charge on it. It's going to do something to get rid of that positive charge, so it's either going to take electrons back from the carbon, which means it's going backwards, or it's going to take electrons back from the hydrogen that it's attached to, which is what's going to move us forward and give us something new. So let's see what happens if we do that. So now I've got an OH, I've got an OCH3, and I've got an H plus that I just made. So now I've got an H plus. I've got oxygens here, which I know are partially negative. And so this H is going to then go on to one of the two oxygens, right? Just again, because they're both partially negative. Now, it, you can imagine it, go, it might go on the O where the CH3 is. That's just going back a step, which is why I drew this as a reversible step. So let's see what happens if we add it to the oxygen where the hydroxyl was, right? Let's have the other oxygen pick up that H+. That's going to give me this intermediate. Uh, let me draw it here instead. So I've got a positive, and I've got an OCH3. And again, I've got that same situation I had two intermediates ago, where I have a positive um, oxygen that wants to take electrons back from something. So again, it can either take them from the OH, which is or taken from the hydrogen, which is going backwards, or it can take them from the C bond and just leave as water, right? We've seen water leave before. And that would be something new. So let's take a look at that one. So 
So I would leave a positive here, and I'd leave water. And this carbocation is not so bad, right, because it's resonance stabilized, right? I could easily draw um, where these electrons drop down, and we get a resonance stabilization here. And so I've got a resonance stabilized carbocation, which means that water, you know, it's not so bad leaving, right? It's a secondary carbocation, plus it's, it's, uh, um, it's that charge is delocalized. <clears throat> so now the thing is, right, I've got this intermediate. This looks kind of a lot like my protonated carbonyl over here. Now, just like with that, it's very electrophilic. It's a very electrophilic intermediate. So it's going to bring some nucleophile into that carbon. Now, if it's the water that we just produced, that's going back a step. That absolutely can happen. Just go backwards. Or this is where we said, I've got a second equivalent of alcohol present. And so this second equivalent of alcohol can be the thing that attacks to kick those electrons up. I think I've run out of room for myself. That happens sometimes. That's OK. So now I can draw an O CH3 with a plus and another OCH3 attached here, right? So the one with the positive is the new one that I drew. Again, oxygen is positive, not super happy, going to take electrons back from something. If the O takes it back from the carbon bond, that's going back a step. If it takes it from a hydrogen, that's going forward a step. And that gives us our acetal. This is sorry for getting all scrunched up here. I did not plan this mechanism out very well. All right, plus you created more H plus, which is which makes sense, right, given that this is just a catalyst. All right, it's just a catalyst, so you remade it. And so that's how you'd make your acetal, right? That's that's the product that you'd make. <clears throat> now and so, so that's it's a lot of reversible steps. Um, the way you get this to go forward, right? You might be asking yourself, well, if it's so reversible, how how do I get anything to go forward at all? Usually, what you do is you try to to dehydrate this somehow, right? The idea is that you want to remove water, you try to remove water as best as you can, right? If you want to drive this reaction forward, right? Just think Le Chatelier's principle: you produce water as a product. If you remove water, that helps drive it forward. So that can partially be just purely by dilution. It can be thing, using things like molecular sieves or something like that. You can try to use Dean Stark traps and make azeotropes to get rid of the water, depending on what your alcohol is. Um, there's all kinds of different things that you can do to remove water. But that's how you'd form your acetal. Now, like we said, to undo an acetal, to remove an acetal and go back to the parent carbonyls, you add acid and water. And if you take a look at this mechanism, it should show you why, right? We're saying if you add acid, right, so I'll put down here to reverse, right, we want to add acid and water. It's because adding acid is going to make this first step go backwards. Then your alcohol, your, your methanol that you just protonated can leave. Then your water can add back in, which goes backwards. Then it can lose an H which goes backwards. Um, if it loses the H, then the um, O-methyl can pick it up, which goes backwards. If the O-methyl picks it up, it can leave as methanol, which goes backwards. Then you have your carbonyl, which can lose an H, which gets you all the way back to your product. So it's exactly the same mechanism, just everything in reverse. So if you wanted to know what the mechanism of removing an acetal going back to the parent carbonyl, this is the same mechanism. It's the exact same thing. So let's quickly look at a few um, examples. I know this is getting kind of long here. Um, so I'm just going to redraw. It looks like in this case I have uh, ethanol. So I'm going to add two ethanol pieces. Um, for this one, I will just do the line bond drawing for time's sake. But again, the idea is you just take whatever carbon here was the carbonyl and make sure that you put two of the OR groups on it, right? If these were O-ethyls, you put two O-ethyls hanging off. That's it. Here's another example where um, one, two, three carbons where I have a diol. So instead of having two alcohols, I have one diol. Works the same way. I would redraw this exact same thing. This is the same cyclohexanone. Um, so here's my carbonyl carbon. Only now I'm going to draw my O's coming off, and they are linked together 
one, two, three. So my product looks something like that. That uh, looks kind of like a silly animal. Let's... There you go. That's what it would look like, right? That's what it would look like. <clears throat> um, for this aldehyde, it looks like I'm adding ethanol again, but the aldehydes function just the same. Don't know why that's sliding all over. Ethanols, or the, um, ethanol is going to behave just the same with an aldehyde as it would a ketone. No, no difference here. So O ethyl, O ethyl. <clears throat> same exact idea. And then lastly, for this one, I wanted to show you just a reversal, an example of a reversal one, taking one off. And we'll see lots of examples of this in the um, acetalsis protecting groups. But if I look at this, right, this is my acetal carbon, right? Because this is the carbon with the OR and the OR. That's the one with the two ethers on it. So I know that when I reverse this, that's just going to go back to a carbonyl. And if I take a look at that carbon, the only other th the things that are coming off of that carbon is this big alkyl group. And there's one little sneaky hydrogen there, right? That fourth thing is a hydrogen. So to draw my product, I just redraw whatever I was given. Let me make this a little nicer. I'm going to redraw what I was given. Mm, I don't like that sloppiness. Not that that's much better. I don't know why it looks so funny. That's okay. It's not okay. <laughs> and then this would now be the aldehyde, right? So that, that carbon right there just turned into an aldehyde. And then the alcohol comes off as, as this dial, right? But this would be your product. So here's just a few examples of making the acetals. And like I said before, we'll talk more about using them as protecting groups in uh, the next video. Please let me know if you have any questions. Happy studying and good luck.